Hello friends, this is Sanjeev Kaushik and welcome to my channel, Methodical Trades. This video is going to be one of the most interesting and insightful videos I've ever created. We will not only talk about the implications of investing in LIC, but in general as well, we will try to understand how insurance industry works, how it manages its risk, and of course, how it actually makes money. And somewhere in between, we would also learn why Warren Buffett himself believes that insurance is one of the best businesses ever created. I can assure you one thing. The perspective from which I am analyzing the investment in LIC is going to be an entirely new perspective. You wouldn't have seen this kind of analysis anywhere, be it news channels, newspapers, or wherever you get your daily dose of news from. But let me show you one thing. This is the only perspective on the basis of which the investment in insurance industry should be carried out, be it one company or the entire industry. So without any further ado, let's get started. And as Peter Lynch always says, know what you are investing in. And therefore, we should know how an insurance industry actually works before investing in any insurance company. So how does insurance actually work? You pick any kind of insurance, be it health insurance, life insurance, auto insurance, they all work on a same principle and the principle is called the law of large numbers. So what is law of large numbers? Rather than giving you a definition, which is kind of boring as well as very technical, let me take an example here. Let's say I toss a coin. Now, the chances for me to get heads or tails are 50% each. So the probability of outcome when I am tossing the coin is always 50%. 50% heads, 50% tails. Now, instead of tossing once, let's say I am tossing 10 times. And now I want to find out out of those 10 times, how many times would I get heads and how many times I would get tails. And if I asked you, Based on the probability, don't you think that I should get the heads five times and tails five times? Why? Because the probability is 50% and I'm going to toss for 10 times. So 50% into 10, five heads, five tails. But we wouldn't really be so confident. What can really happen is we will get, say, seven heads and three tails or the other way around. And it is also entirely possible that we might even get 10 heads in a row. Right. So this is a case where I am tossing the coin only 10 times, even though I know the probability, I can't really be sure how many times I will get heads and how many times I will get tails. But let's extrapolate the same example. And this time, rather than tossing the coin for just 10 times, if I would toss the coin, say 10,000 times, then the law of large numbers will kick in. The law of large numbers would say that as I would toss the coin and the number of total observations or the number of total tosses would start approaching 10,000, then there are very good chances that the number of times that I received heads will be equivalent to 50% of the times that is very close to 5,000. And of course, the number of time I would receive tails is also going to be very close to 5000. So the law of large numbers states that if we know the probability of the outcome of a certain event, and if that event happens over a large number of times, then the average outcomes of all these large events are going to be equivalent to the probability of the outcome of the single event. Still confusing? It can be. But just know one thing. The more number of times we would toss the coin, the more chances that that 50% probability that we know of, we would actually get to that kind of an average. We might not get it by tossing the coin, let's say 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, and even 100 times. But if we will toss the coin 10,000 times, then the probability of getting heads is going to be 50% and the probability of getting tails is going to be 50%. So you will get 5,000 on heads and 5,000 on tails. However, the law of large numbers isn't very clear to our brains in an intuitive manner. 
it takes a little bit of practice and consciously being aware of law of large numbers before we can actually trust this law. And of course, as I said, fundamentally, insurance works on it. So therefore, at least insurance industry, by and large, acknowledges the existence of law of large numbers and also bases its premium pricing as well as the number of claims that it expects to be made over a given period of time on this law. Now, why am I saying that it doesn't really sound like common sense? Let's say we are driving in a car. We don't really feel too worried, too concerned when we are driving in a car about our own well-being as compared to flying in an aeroplane. Even though statistically, there are one out of 112 chances for us to die in a car crash, then dying in an aeroplane where our chances are one out of 96,566. And why do we feel safer as compared to driving in a car than flying in a plane? Because when we are driving ourselves or if we are interacting with the driver, we somehow feel that we are in control or that even if something were to happen while we are driving, chances are we might not even die. On the other hand, if we are flying in a plane, we don't know who the pilot is, right? We can't see the person. We don't feel in control at all. We don't even know whether the pilot himself is flying or the plane is flying in autopilot mode. So we are definitely concerned or we are a little too worried all the time when we are flying as compared to driving. And of course, we know that any mishappening when we are flying would mean death right away in most of the instances. So now that we know how the law of large number actually works, how do insurance companies implement law of large numbers in their own business? You see, all they have to do is make sure that they insure enough number of people or they sell out enough number of insurance policies, right? To be able to not only cover all the claims that will be made, but also make sure that the company remains profitable and solvent in a long run. And how do you do that? You rely on law of large numbers because you know, let's say while driving, one out of 112 instances would lead to accidents. So in other words, 111 of instances, they will not have to pay out the claim. All they have to do is make sure that the pricing of the premium that all the insureds will pay is adequate enough to cover for whichever claims that they will have to pay in future. And this is the law of large numbers. And based on all these, they are able to calculate mathematically or statistically, which is more appropriate. How is it that they should be pricing the premiums? And the process of pricing the premium using statistical models is called underwriting. Now, this was about the importance of law of large numbers in insurance. We should all be very much aware of it. And that's also the reason why if you live in, let's say, a fire prone area where during summers the, the, the jungle catches fire or the mountain itself catches fire, then your house insurance in that area would cost you more as compared to living in a very safe area where there are absolutely no chances of fire due to any uh, natural calamity or anything like that, right? So the law of large numbers for people living in fire prone areas actually works against them as compared to the law of large numbers that is in an area where there are absolutely no chances of fire. Now that we know how insurance actually works, it's all about numbers. The more number of people that you can insure, the more chances that you would stay afloat and stay profitable in the long run. But the insurance business is not as simplistic as it sounds. What you have here in front of your screen is a very simplistic insurance business model. Here, this is the insurance company, right? And they collect premiums. And of course, they pay claims to the insured. However, I hope that most of you are already aware that even insurance companies insure all their businesses and the industry that provides insurance to insurance companies are called reinsurers. So what reinsurers do is 
they collect premiums from insurance companies and in return, whatever claims that insurance companies had to pay, some part of it is made good by these reinsurers. And how does the insurer make sure that it remains profitable? Simply by making sure that it is adhering to the law of large numbers, by making sure that enough premiums are collected, by selling enough policies so that they have enough of the money coming in into their pool of funds. And now, moving on from how an insurance business works, let's try to understand how insurance companies actually make money. So what you are looking over here is pool of funds where all the premiums paid go into this pool of funds, right? And we're talking about any insurance company, not just specific to LIC. This is how a proper insurance industry works. All the claims that are paid out by insurance companies are paid out from the pool of funds that is created by collecting the premiums from the insured customers, right? And of course, not just the claims, the premiums that are paid to reinsurance companies are also paid out from the pool of funds. And because it's a business, they will have to pay for the expenses related to running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. That would also involve all the marketing, all the sales, all the operations cost of running the business, growing the business, and of course, paying the salaries and so on. But the most important aspect of an insurance industry is to make sure that it remains solvent. So what it means is that there are risk management guidelines or rather compliance rules that every insurance industry or the businesses of insurance must comply with. Or you can also consider them as your regulatory rules that they must comply with. And the rule that governs risk management in insurance is called Solvency 2. In its original form, it was Solvency 1 and then it was revised and now it's Solvency 2. And in a very simplistic manner, Solvency 2 essentially mandates the capital that insurance companies must set aside to make sure that all their future liabilities, including both the claims being paid, business expenses, as well as payments to reinsurers, are fully covered from this capital that they've set aside, right? And it can be anywhere from say 10, 15, or even 20% of the total pool of funds, which is also dependent upon the business size or the claims that are being anticipated over let's say one year or so. So every business will have to set aside this capital, which is usually called solvency capital requirement, SCR. And this capital should be in cash and cash equivalent instruments. So this in totality is how an insurance business works. And after paying all these expenses, if there's still anything left, that is supposed to be the actual profit of an insurance company. So far, so good, right? It is definitely unique, but no different from any other business, right? You get your revenue in terms of your premiums being received, and then you have a whole bunch of other expenses and other liability. After paying all of them, whatever is left with you, that's your profit, right? But here begins the fun. And now we are circling back to Life Insurance Corporation. Do you know that just before the IPO of LIC, it owned roughly 10 lakh crores worth of stocks in the listed companies of India. 10 lakh crores. Now, you might think that insurance is definitely a profitable business, right? Because LIC, of course, it's a mammoth and it has been investing in Indian stock market for such a long period of time. But do insurance companies really make that kind of money that LIC owns 10 lakh crore worth of stocks in Indian stock market? Let's dig a little deeper into this particular point. And let's say after paying all the expenses, the insurance company or you can even consider LIC here for the example purpose, 
is still left with investable surplus, which it would invest in, say, blue chip companies. And this is not hypothetical. The table on top over here covers the 10 companies where LIC owns more than 10% stake in those companies, right? And on top is IDBI Bank, as well as LIC Housing Finances. Virtually, both of them are owned by LIC India, and LIC also owns 16% of ITC. The table at the bottom contains 10 companies where LIC has its biggest holdings. So LIC's biggest holding is Reliance Industries, which also happens to be the biggest company in India. So this investable surplus or pool of funds that any insurance company collects, a major chunk of it goes into stock markets. So the name of the game when it comes to insurance is not insurance, it's investments. You see, when you value an insurance company, you look at what kind of investments does it own, right? And based on that, you assign a market cap to that particular company. In fact, how much money a company overall makes, it usually depends upon what kind of profits it is able to generate from its investments. Now, remember, we're talking about insurance company that is supposed to make its money from selling insurance. No, the insurance related earnings are pretty much only enough to pay for the claims and run the business expenses and manage risk and also pay the premiums to the reinsurers. The real money, the real earnings of insurance companies comes from their own investments. And to give you an idea here, the market cap of LIC is somewhere around 6 lakh crores. Right? And that is right after listing. The company has already become one of the five biggest companies in India by market cap. Now compare the 6 lakh crores market cap with the 10 lakh crore worth of holdings that LIC owns. Now you may ask why? Why should LIC have a lower market cap when it owns stocks worth 10 lakh crores? Isn't it funny? Right? But it is no mystery at all. You see, if you have, let's say, a pile of stocks and if you go to a bank and say, I have, let's say, stocks worth a thousand. Now, can you lend me some money against that? Bank is not going to lend you a thousand bucks against the thousand bucks worth of holdings of yours. No, they would apply what is called a haircut. Right? And in return of those thousand bucks worth of stocks, which the bank will take as a collateral or as a security against the loan, they're going to pay you say five or six bucks. So keeping the entire insurance business of LIC aside, you can say that investors have applied a haircut of 40% to LIC's stock holdings. And that's why the market cap of LIC is six lakh crores. Can we say that? It won't really be entirely logical, but it's a very crude form of putting how an uh, insurance company is valued in stock market. So never ever forget, insurance is not really the real game. The real game is investments. In fact, it also depends upon how good an investment manager the insurance company employs. If they own an investment manager like Warren Buffett, then that insurance company can grow exponentially and it can keep on generating profits because at the end of the day, the profits are generated from investments. The insurance business is just the face. Talking about Warren Buffett, do you know why Warren Buffett adores the business of insurance? Of course, all these companies that you're looking at, either Warren Buffett owns them outright or a major part of Warren Buffett's holdings or Berkshire Hathaway's holdings are in these companies. Before we talk about the why part, why Warren Buffett loves them so much, 
Let me draw a comparison between a bank and an insurance company. Fundamentally, they all do the same thing, right? A bank also collects money from its customers and so does the insurance company. But the purpose of taking that money from the customers and the conditions on which the money would be paid back to the customers are entirely different. In case of a bank, whenever a bank receives money in terms of deposits, be it savings deposits or fixed deposits and so on, the bank is liable to pay back the interest rates, which can be prevailing interest rate. It can be as low as say 0.04% in terms of any developed economy, or it can be as high as say four to five percent in developing country like India, right? But bank is liable to pay some kind of interest. If a bank would say, I don't want to pay any interest, nobody would deposit any money in that particular bank. And if the bank will not get money, how would they lend it to their borrowers, right? So banks will have to pay interest. On the other hand, an insurance company collects the money and will only repay if a claim is made. If no claim made, then the insurance company will get to keep the money entirely. They are not at all liable to pay back. So can you understand the difference here? And now I hope you're also able to realize why Warren Buffett loves the business of insurance. It's not like Warren Buffett doesn't own banks, right? Warren Buffett also has major holdings in some of the biggest banks, yet Warren Buffett doesn't really own banks outright, just like it owns insurance companies. Why? Because all this free cash flow that comes in into the pool of funds, that is investable pool of funds for Warren Buffett. Now imagine doing the same thing for last few decades and being as good as investment manager as Warren Buffett is. So are you still surprised why he is one of the richest person ever walked on earth? No. Here is a talented person who knows how to pick good companies at cheap valuation when the markets are throwing away all these stocks. He owned them and his superpower lies in owning this free cash flow that is generated by all these insurance companies that he owns. And of course, once you have this compounding that starts kicking in, you start collecting a whole lot of dividends from your own investments that would swell up your investable surplus kitty, which has already been growing at a decent pace. And that's why Warren Buffett is a strong believer in insurance business. And it's not like he hasn't done mistakes. Of course, Warren Buffett has also made mistakes. Every investment manager makes mistakes. But the point I'm trying to make here is, as an insurance company, you can make much, much, much more money than you actually do if you have got a really good investment manager. So if you would hire a Warren Buffett or someone to the same tune or someone with the same aptitude and attitude that Warren Buffett has, chances are your insurance company can grow much larger, right? But even if that does not happen, whenever a fundamental analyst would look at an insurance company, first and foremost, they would look at how much of investments that this insurance company owns and what kind of investments that they own. There are some superstar investment managers that are hired by some of the biggest insurance companies. Let's go back to the example of LIC and I want to talk about the implications of investing in LIC. And I definitely don't want to talk about things that you probably might already have read or heard about. For example, how LIC has the lion's share, although it has been losing out its market share to other smaller players, yet it owns more than 60% of the India's insurable market. I don't want to talk about it. And I also don't want to talk about how India remains an underpenetrated country when it comes to insurance. No, you might have already heard or read about it. I don't want to sing the same tune again. I want to talk about things that are fresh, new, and a completely different perspective. So how would investment in LIC look like five years, 10 years, even 50 years down the line? You see, the performance of the 
stock of LIC would always remain highly correlated with the performance of its own holdings or in other words, the performance of the stock market of India. So it wouldn't be entirely wrong saying that when you're betting on LIC, you're essentially betting on India. You're essentially betting on the insurance in India. And of course, you're also betting on the blue chip companies listed in Indian stock market. Why? Because essentially that's exactly what LIC owns, right? That's its biggest asset all the investments, right? And if those investments will come down in value, let's say if tomorrow there's a crash and uh, Nifty 50 falls down by 40%, I can assure you that LIC would most certainly fall by 40% in the same scenario, if not more, right? Because the haircut thing, the same haircut would be applied. Right? And LIC would also never have its market cap exceeding its total investments. It would never happen. LIC, of course, would remain a very attractive investment for those seeking dividends on a regular basis. And of course, this is true for any public sector company. So LIC will be no different. LIC already is a profit making company, and that's why it would pay a whole lot of dividend in future as well. As the dividends in its investments will grow, so will the dividends paid out by LIC. So it won't be entirely wrong to say that maybe 10 years, 15 years down the line, all your initial investment in LIC would be completely paid out in terms of dividends. Dividends in public sector companies are a must are given. Why? Because government of India mandates them to pay dividends so that government of India can generate some extra revenue from its investments. Because the government of India still is virtually the owner of LIC India, the rest of the public hardly owns any piece of it yet. Therefore, unfortunately, the stock price will remain capped for this company. You wouldn't see many fold returns on your capital investment in LIC. And the reason for that is very simple. It doesn't matter which party is ruling the country. They're all going big bang on divestments. And as LIC's stock price will grow, they would want to divest a very small stake from LIC to the public. And obviously, the government usually does that at a bit of a discount, which means there will always remain a cap on how high the LIC stock can actually go. But Let's not let the cap on LIC deter you from making any investments in LIC India. Now, I'm not really recommending. I can't even recommend. I'm not even an expert on doing fundamental analysis and so on. At best, I'm just a trader who nobody knows about. But think of the world where after 100 years, the government of India has exited from the company completely. A company with the scale of LIC, and I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but LIC has business outside India as well. Some of the other Asian countries have also got branches of LIC. So a company with a scale of LIC, if it starts operating like any other privately owned company, this company can have huge potential. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to happen in the next 10 years, not even 20 years, 30 years. But at some stage, all the government ownerships in all the government owned companies will come down to zero or very close to zero. Maybe the government may want to keep a stake of 10, 15%, but they will not be the decision maker. Things have already started happening in LIC. As a company becomes public, they already become much more accountable, right? So far, LIC has only been paying dividend to India, right? So the government of India used to receive all the dividends. Now, LIC is also answerable to some of the other institutional investors who may not be sitting on the board with much of a power, yet they can ask difficult questions from the LIC management. So the professionalization of LIC has already begun. And I'm not really discounting the, the, the company as such. I believe they are one of the best run companies in India, right? And 
considering the scale at which they have been operating, they have done a wonderful job for the country. But they are going to do even better a job in future as well. Because now quarter on quarter, they will see that they are being pushed to post better results than the previous quarter, right? So psychologically and even fundamentally or just the pressure of being listed or being able to answer properly to all the difficult questions that will be posed at the management, they would definitely feel the pressure of performing better than they otherwise would have had they remained privately owned company, which is owned by the government of India. So I'm hopeful that LIC would definitely be a game changer for long term investor. However, future is still very much uncertain. And a bit of a disclaimer, I do own a very small quantity of stocks of LIC India, and I am also planning on adding more on it. But I just want to see how its performance is going to be over the next one to two months. Nonetheless, I would definitely remain a dip buyer on LIC stock. Thanks a lot for giving me your time. Do let me know in the comments if you liked this kind of analysis. And if you also want me to cover any other companies, then do put the name of those companies in the comments below. And I'll be more than happy to bring in fresh perspective on that company. And I'll see you soon.